Anybody here know how difficult it is to be an atheist with a biblical name? Anybody have one? Seth. It's Hebrew. It means appointed or appointed one. In the book of Genesis, Seth was the third son of Adam, right? Cain and Abel had that big tete-a-tete. And uh, so Seth was the appointed one. And the irony is thick. You know, it's like going to a party and people say, so you speak out against the Bible because you don't believe in it? I say, yeah. And they go, what's your name? And I, it's like saying, Hezekiah. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, really? Are you kidding? I hate to start tonight by looking backwards, but I need to in order to make my first point, okay? It's, it's a common tactic for those of us that are arguing for reason against superstition. And in order to demonstrate it, I want to go back in time. Now, the second video I ever produced once I had started the YouTube channel was a little ditty called The Story of Susie. And uh, I revisited Susie's video back in January of this year. Uh, I gave it a facelift, we went to HD, I updated some of the graphics, okay? Two days after the updated video went live, there was an article in the Christian Post, and it said, Atheist depicts Christians as delusional in Story of Susie video. And of course, I was pretty ecstatic. <laughs> Not because I had called anyone delusional, but because if we're only talking to each other, and the religious are never involved, what good are we? It's patting each other on the back. We want the religious community to realize that we are seeing this scenario differently. So I was pretty, pretty excited. Three hours before her publication deadline, the author, her name is Catherine Fan, sent me an email request for comment. Three hours before her deadline. I was using an email spam service at the time. I don't use it anymore for this reason. But have you seen those services where you have to, to verify? Someone sends you an email and then they get a bounce back that says, we want to confirm that you are not spam. Please click here or fill in this code. And her email was never verified. It never arrived in my inbox. It was only when I was cleaning out my online spam box, well after the article had gone live, that I even realized it existed. So, I think it might be a little interesting that Catherine sent me an 11th hour request to comment on my own work. Yet she somehow found the time to locate and interview a religious author, philosopher, and apologist named Dr. Norman L. Geisler for an 18 paragraph article in the Christian Post. Fine. Let's assume she was operating in good faith. Let's assume she was genuinely trying to get through to me. Let's assume she didn't understand the email verification process. Fine. They didn't need me to prove my points in the article, as I will demonstrate for you here. But in order to demonstrate it, I need to show you the video. Do you mind watching it again? Three minutes long, I uh, present for your approval the second video I ever produced, which re-released in January, called The Story of Susie. This is the story of Susie. Susie believed in Jesus, and Jesus is the light of the world. Before each meal, Susie would thank Jesus for the food someone else bred, slaughtered, harvested, canned, prepared, cooked, and presented. No food would be eaten until it was properly blessed. Before bedtime, Susie would pray for Jesus to heal the sick, comfort the afflicted, and ease the suffering in the world. Of course, when Susie awoke, the world's problems were still there. But somehow, it was all part of God's divine plan. When Susie got sick, she prayed for healing. Then she paid a doctor, took prescription medication, and took weeks to recover naturally. When Susie was confused, she prayed for answers. When her ears picked up no audible reply, she simply guessed and called it divine inspiration. When Susie's mother was in a car accident, Susie thanked God that mum was only horribly injured and not killed immediately. Susie then prayed to Jesus for healing, and then she paid thousands of dollars to trained medical personnel. Susie went to church, thanking Jesus for being so good. When the pastor was suddenly gunned down by a crazed madman during a sermon about divine protection, 
Susie was horrified, so she prayed a prayer of thanks that Pasta was in a better place. She also prayed for the widow and children that they would see that it's all part of God's special plan for their lives. When hurricanes came, Susie prayed and thanked Jesus that only a few thousand were homeless and only a few billion dollars in damage was done. For the millions worldwide afflicted with disease, Susie prayed and asked Jesus that a vaccine might be found in a laboratory. After all, it made sense that science should do the actual healing. God was busy making the world wonderful. For the starving and oppressed, Susie wore a special ribbon that showed how much she cared. Then she went home and watched American Idol. Yes, everywhere she looked, Susie saw the omnipotent hand and never failing love of God. And once again, just before bedtime, Susie closed her eyes and said her prayers because she believed in Jesus and Jesus is the light of the world. It won't make the Cartoon Network, but I think it gets the point across. Anybody know any Susies? Anybody here used to be Susie? I used to think a lot uh, like uh, Susie. We invoked God at every turn, and yet the solutions we found were human ones. Well, Dr. Geisler, and it was funny in the article, instead of Norman, they did a typo and didn't find it. They called him normal. Dr. Geisler said, you look at all of that and you sympathize with Susie because you think they, disasters, illnesses, etc., are evil. Now, you just saw it, folks. Does any frame of that video imply that disasters and illness are evil. Do you guys see that? It happens. But I didn't bring evil to the table. The apologist does. They have no consciousness. They are naturally occurring phenomena with scientific explanations. So the apologist refutes an argument that I did not make. That ever happened to you guys? That ever happened to you guys? Yes. I can tell it's late. Then he goes on to explain, but if it's evil, then there must be a standard for good. If there is a crooked line in this world, then there must be a straight line. If there is a straight line, then there must be God. It ain't over. Quote from the article, natural disaster and illness are not part of God's original plan for the world, stated Geisler, but it is man's sin that messed up the natural order. We brought in death, judgment, and the whole creation groaning. There weren't any tornadoes, hurricanes, or tsunamis in the Garden of Eden. There won't be any in the new heaven and new earth, he said. God made a perfect world. He's going to remake one. In between, we messed up this one. Hurricane Katrina? It's our fault. The, Japan, uh, the Japanese earthquake and tsunami, it's our fault. Cancer is our fault. Birth defects, it's our fault. If a meteor slams into the planet and kills every living thing, it's somehow our fault. Have you guys heard that? Man sinned in the garden and it's all of our fault for being alive today because we're descendants of Adam. It's terrible. <laughs> And the cherry on top, the climax of the article, bears this priceless quote from the good Dr. Geisler. It says, God permits evil to bring a greater good. So let's review. The Christian Post has just told us that sinful man causes natural disasters. Natural disasters are evil. If there is evil, the crooked line, there must be a God, a straight line. God, the straight line, <laughs> lets evil happen to demonstrate his goodness. This man has a PhD, which tells you something. Do not recuse yourself from an argument or a debate or a discussion or a conversation because someone has a greater degree than you do. We all get to participate in the discussion because it affects all of us. And education comes in many forms. 
We all have a lot of experience, life experience. I'm amazed at what people have learned just from their own digging. Don't let someone intimidate you with credentials and initials, and you will find, especially in the religious community, they throw those initials around like hand grenades. They put them in all caps. The Christian Post article was picked up by uh, the science blog at The Guardian. P.Z. Myers carried it in some other places. It, it's a good example of what religion has to come up with. It refutes an argument that I did not make, it answering charges I, I never made, constantly changing the rules, smoke and mirrors, straw men and apologetics. It is what I call the shell game. And there are many, many examples of the shell games people play to justify their beliefs. Now conduct an experiment. Show the following article to somebody who is a Christian, okay? Tell them, man celebrates 323rd birthday. Tell them it's a true story printed in the paper. What's the first thing that comes out of their mouth? That's dumb. That's ridiculous. I don't believe it. Then relate the words of Genesis chapter 5, where it says that a man named Methuselah lived to be 969, and they say, oh, that's real. Three times longer, by the way, than the original guy in the joke. Tell a Christian when you got up for work this morning, your cocker spaniel complained about how you spanked him for being disobedient. And he spoke to you in English and said, please don't do that anymore. What response would you get? They'd say, what are you smoking? <laughs> and where do I get some? Don't insult my intelligence, a talking dog, what are you talking about? But relate the Bible story in Numbers 22, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord had laid down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? The donkey talks, and the believer replies, That really happened? It's in the Bible. Not only does the religious person say he buys it, but he says an invisible God character taught the donkey how to do it. On one hand, it is ludicrous. On the other hand, well, it makes perfect sense. Try this one. Over dinner, ask, is homosexuality a sin? Especially in this part of the country, what's the answer? Yes. Why do you say it's a sin? Well, the Bible says so. And you say, where in the Bible? And the answer is, hell, I don't know. It's in there somewhere. It's in the Bible, damn it. Homosexuality is a sin. Most people can't even cite the chapter or the book, let alone chapter and verse. But let's say you get lucky. You find somebody who can actually quote the command in, let's say, let's find the one in Leviticus. You shall not lie with a male as a woman. It is an abomination. Now, when I suggest you talk about this topic with your believing friend, do it over dinner, preferably at a seafood restaurant, <laughs> which will provide a fantastic segue. Because the same book of the Bible calls the eating of shellfish an abomination. Leviticus 11, 12, whatever hath no fins nor scales in the water shall be an abomination unto you. And then you look at him and go, how's the shrimp? Is it good? There's a hysterical website I found. It's called God Hates Shrimp. Have you seen it? It's brilliant. The top paragraph reads, shrimp, crab, lobster, clams, mussels, all these are an abomination before the Lord, just as gays are an abomination. Why stop at protesting gay marriage? Bring all of God's law under the heathens and the sodomites. We call upon all Christians to join the crusade against Long John Silvers and Red Lobster. Yea, even Popeye shall be cleansed. <laughs> the name of Baba shall be an anathema. We must stop the unbelievers from destroying the sanctity of our restaurants. <laughs> These guys also offer downloadable signs that say stuff like, pinch the tail, suck the head, burn in hell. <laughs> I sent them an email and I said, I love you guys. I love that sense of humor. It's a shell game. It's a parlor trick. It applies here, but it doesn't apply there. It's a prize here. It's a loser over here. How many Christians love bacon? 
And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew, the cud is unclean to you. Can you imagine a life without bacon? <sighs> How many Christians shave? Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Same book, by the way, as the book that decries homosexuality as an abomination. The book that people use to discriminate against an entire culture of people. How many Christians oppose slavery as immoral? They'd raise their hand and say, it's immoral. Slavery is wrong. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them... You may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. Same book. How many Christian farmers plant their fields with multiple crops wearing a shirt that's a cotton polyester blend? That's bad news. Don't plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear material woven of two kinds of materials. Same book. Leviticus. I'm amazed at how little I knew about the commandments in Leviticus and Exodus when I was a believer and we read the Bible all the time. You as a Christian, do you celebrate the festival of the unleavened bread? Exodus chapter 34. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. It's a command for seven days eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv for in that month you came out of Egypt. Do you sacrifice the firstborn of your animals to God? Look at the little kid. He's got to go. He's the firstborn. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. All right, so you don't adhere to any of these other commandments, even though they're in the same Bible, mainly in the same book as the reference to homosexuality. How many Christians work on Saturday? You're not remembering the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Exodus 31, 15, whoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Can we digress for just a second and just talk about the Sabbath? <laughs> <clears throat> Did you know that Orthodox Jews believe it is a sin to flick a light switch on the, on the Sabbath? Writing a letter is a sin on the Sabbath. Preparing your food is a no-no on the Sabbath. And I'm not making this up. Companies like Electrolux, Maytag, Kenmore, Whirlpool, GE, and many others manufacture, manufacture kitchen appliances with something called Sabbath mode. Do you guys see my video on the Sabbath? These appliances are Star K kosher certified, and here's how they work, folks. On the Sabbath, these appliances are set so that no lights, no fans, no solenoids, no tones or displays are going to operate, even turning the knob on the stove to adjust the burner is considered violating God's command. However, for the more progressive observant Jew, an organization called Torah Technologies has developed a device they called the tweaker, <laughs> which shuts off all the lights and dials and allows manual adjustment, including the option of a time delay. So you can turn the dial on Friday, it delays, kicks the heat on on Saturday when nobody's around and then shuts it off on Sunday. Congratulations, you have outsmarted God. <laughs> Sabbath mode even disables your oven light because an oven light means the closing of an electrical circuit. That constitutes an action. Action is prohibitive. You're not even allowed to strike a match or flick a lighter. I am sorry. 18,000 children starved to death today. The World Health Organization says over 12 million people will be diagnosed with cancer in 2012. Nations are tearing themselves apart, and the almighty creator of the universe is concerned about whether or not you and I do this. <laughs> and yet an entire culture has bent over backwards. 
the Ten Commandments amaze me. And then they're very elementary, in my opinion. I mean, look at the first four. They're all about God's vanity. Me, 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 me. We're at number five before he gets into how to act with your flesh and blood human beings and your father and mother. But look at the Ten Commandments and people who argue for the validity and the importance of the commandments, the same people who usually cannot name even five of the ten. Look at them objectively. How hard was it to come up with those? How hard was it to come up with the rest of them? How many other cultures who didn't have the Ten Commandments came up with something similar? I saw a photo online that could have replaced the 31,000 verses in the Christian Bible that has one simple command with four words. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Don't be a dick. Everybody remembers it. You're going to be at home tonight in bed looking at the ceiling going, Don't be a dick. Let's look at another example. Think about how many Christians wear necklaces with the cross on it, or earrings, or tattoos, or whatever. Now, if you wear the cross because you like the way the symbol, that's, I'm, I'm down with that. I get that. I'm talking about people who are honoring their Savior with it, OK? The cross, used for crucifixion, a long and extremely painful form of execution where you were tied to or nailed to wooden beams and left to hang there until dead. Death by crucifixion often took many, many agonizing unimaginable days. So painful that it's where we got the word excruciating. It comes from crucifixion. It translates out of crucifying. Almost always you're crucified naked. You urinate and defecate on yourself in front of everyone. Sometimes the guards watching over your demise are ready to be done and go home. So they hasten your death with any number of hideous practices. They take an iron rod and they shatter your legs. They spear you in the heart. They slam you repeatedly in the chest. Or they might build a fire at the bottom of your cross so the fumes come up and you asphyxiate. So naturally, you'd want one of these hanging around your neck. <laughs> no, no, the faithful say the cross is a symbol bringing to life the words of Matthew 16. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. There's a pastor at Sermon Central named Don Schultz. He did an article, and it was called, What Does the Cross Mean to You? And he summed it up like this, and I think it's pretty accurate. It says, As you consider all the sins in your life and wonder, can God really forgive me? Then remember the cross. There Jesus calls out to you and assures you are forgiven, that you will be with him in paradise. Every Sunday morning you hear that God forgives you. It's because of the cross. The sacrament of holy baptism, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, these are God's gifts to you, made possible only by the cross. Fine. Fine. I get that. Now watch this. Go up to a religious person and ask, by that standard, would you do the same thing if Christ had been executed by guillotine? <laughs> or hanged? Stoned to death? Or, burned at the stake. How gruesome, how macabre, how ridiculous. But the crucifixion cross, well, that makes sense. Another example. Here in the buckle of the Bible Belt, you're no doubt familiar with communion. Everybody know about communion? A holy time of worship where the church comes together to remember and revere Jesus Christ. Mark 14, 22 says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now today, mainstream Protestant churches continue the practice of communion, and they use symbolic elements like grape juice and crackers. Any of you guys former believers? Anybody here? Anybody here ever taken communion? You know what that's about? Now, before you partake, you are supposed to examine your own life, right? You cleanse your heart. 1 Corinthians 11:28. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And once you've reaffirmed your dedication to Christ, then you take communion. I love the Catholic Church's take on communion. It stipulates that you're not actually eating grape juice and bread. 
The official Roman Catholic concept of transubstantiation says, during the sacrament of Holy Communion, the liquid and bread miraculously transform into the substance of Christ himself. They may look like grape juice and crackers, but they're actually the blood and body of Christ. Now, the Vatican says there are 1.8 billion Catholics worldwide, and you ask any one of them, did you take communion? Yeah, yeah, I took communion. Go up to that same person and tell them you just came from a special gathering where you honored the memory of your dead grandpa, Walter, okay? Really, what was that like? We sang, we chanted, we hung out, then we ate his flesh and we drank his blood. <laughs> you sick bastard. <laughs> Then they call 911. In the real world, you wouldn't think of doing such a thing, even symbolically. But with the shell game of religion, it's perfectly fine to be a cannibal for Christ. I saw a great photo online that said, Eat Jesus, one cracker at a time. <laughs> By the way, on the subject of communion, let's say you're religious and you want to partake, okay? But it's, lot, it's logistically, it's just not practical for you to get all the little cups and fill them up and do the bread and all that stuff. So that all of your church members by the hundreds can commune with their savior, it's no problem. There's a website, <laughs> it's called Concordia Supply. It has provided for your convenience the handy portable celebration cup. <laughs> no, this is not coffee creamer. This is the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ. Double sealed, pre-packaged, disposable wafer and juice combo, perfect for anyone who wants to make ritual flesh eating more convenient and cost effective. The website declares double sealed and disposable individual celebration wafer and juice sets com wow, sets combination modern convenience and purity with a taste for tradition. Now this would not be the first time a member of the Catholic Church has asked someone to unseal his wafer. But <laughs> Cracked.com did an article called 20 Tacky Religious Products Guaranteed to Anger God. And I had to bring some with me. I had to show you. There's the Luke 639 roll gum. It bears the cross on the package and declares to the chewer that you measure up. Ah, oh, you're not a gum person. That's all right. Try some tasty testaments. Have you guys seen these? Each mint wrapped in a verse of scripture. It's a great witnessing tool when your non-believing friends say, hey, you got a mint? You can freshen their breath and put a piece of God's message right on their tongue. An Italian business called Pan Ducal offers this tasty treat. The Dolce del Papa. The Pope Cake. Because they say Pope John Paul II really liked the taste. And you can buy these online. You probably heard of the classic poem, Footprints in the Sand. Anybody heard that one? Now you can reenact the classic poem with Jesus Loves You Footwear. <laughs> Jesus Loves You is embossed on the soul, perfect for sandy beaches or muddy trails as you walk with the Savior. Want your kids to feel protected and look like a complete idiot? <laughs> Try the armor of God pajamas. <laughs> and this, don't even get me stuck. Of course, the real reason for these isn't for profit, right? It's not for profit. It's to provide a service to people of their faith and give them an opportunity to express their faith in a meaningful external way. Anybody buy that? No. I don't have a problem with somebody offering a product in the free marketplace. <laughs> Woo. That's good. Look, if people want it, you provide it, everybody gets something, I get that. I use stuff to, to help fund the videos that I do. I get that. The problem with religion is that it somehow provides these projects, pro products and implies that it's somehow enhanced 
It has a higher purpose, a divine message. It's holier than their secular counterparts. Now, the concept of Jesus merchandise is just too tempting, and you know some sacrilegious smartass is going to take the whole, whole idea to another level, right? A company called Burnt Impressions is offering this handy holiday gift. It's the Virgin Mary toaster. <laughs> Why wait for a miracle when you yourself can pay homage to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Toast? 31 bucks online. I almost bought one and brought it with me. At Archie McPhee, you can make God your co-pilot. It's the four-inch plastic dashboard Jesus. The ad actually says, if you don't have a car, stick him up somewhere that you could use a little peace, serenity, or forgiveness. Have you guys heard that song? Well, I don't care if it rains or freezes as long as I got that plastic Jesus sitting on the dashboard of my car. You guys haven't heard that song? No. Yeah. Google it. <laughs> Been around for decades. People always think I'm making it up. Give your loved ones the greatest toy story ever told. It's the entire Bible brought to life with Legos. The Brick Bible, a new spin on the Old Testament. Now, it's the work of a guy who calls himself the Reverend Brendan Powell Smith. If you've never seen his website, it is brilliant. It's thebricktestament.com. I don't know how this man got the time and the creativity to do what he did with Bible stories and Legos. And it sounds insane when I tell you this, but it is art. It is art. It is so amazingly well done. You owe it to yourself to check it out. In fact, I put a link to the Brick Testament on my own site because I wanted people to be able to, to go see it. It's just an amazing thing. And he's a total heathen, too. <laughs> he's a total heathen. Now, people always ask me, why do you give Christianity and the Bible such a hard time? Why? And I respond, why do you give Christianity and the Bible a complete pass? Why? It's a mess. I use parody, sometimes sarcasm, sometimes uh, a jab here or there. It's true. But I'm drawing a circle around very real things that I would hope people would look at eventually, objectively, and say, we have a problem. Ask a Christian if the Bible is perfect and if Jesus is omniscient. Ask if Jesus knows everything, past, present, and future. You almost invariably get a resounding, yes, Jesus knows everything, everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows your every thought. He knows everything. He's Jesus. And calmly read the following passage. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. <laughs> now, ask the question, if the Bible's perfect, why does Matthew 21 say the fig tree immediately withered away? The book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 20, says they discovered the dried up fig tree the following morning. And if Jesus was truly omniscient and he knows every thought and every action, he has every hair on your head numbered, he has the blueprint of the earth and the cosmos committed to memory, why did he not know when figs were in season? <laughs> This week I conducted kind of a casual experiment on Facebook. It's not scientific by any stretch of the imagination. I was just curious. Ask the religious, how important is obedience to God? Everybody always says obedience is so important. We need to be obedient. Please help me be obedient. They pray for the strength to be obedient. Obedience, obedience, obedience. And then, of course, you bring up the story of God's command to Abraham in Genesis 22. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Now, ultimately, God pulled the plug at the last minute, and they sacrificed a ram instead. But this story draws out some very interesting lines of reasoning when people try to defend it. So as a casual experiment, totally unscientific, I was just testing the waters, watching the random responses flow in. I had this question put to various Christians on Facebook to see their responses. And I said, look, if God commanded you, just like he commanded Abraham, to do the same thing, sacrifice your own child, would you do it? The vast majority of believers said, absolutely not. To their credit, they said they would not do it. <coughs> 
but just check out a few of the responses. To be honest, probably not. I would have failed the test if it were my son. Glad God hasn't required that of anyone in 6,000 years. But Abraham had so much faith in God that he knew even if he killed Isaac, God would have brought him back to life. He knew God that well. Now look at the first sentence. Failure is the word that comes right to mind as they defend the life of their own child. They didn't say, I won that battle and guarded my child with my very being, because that is the moral act. They said, I would fail God in this regard. Even as a Christian, no. Very encouraging to hear that, by the way. I couldn't do it. Here's one. I make sure we live in a way that wouldn't give God an excuse to ask me <laughs> to do that to one of my girls. It's a victim mentality, isn't it? I hope I'm living well enough so he doesn't ask me to kill my child. I would have responded to God if given the same command that my children's lives are more important than his command and his test of my faith. Good for them. Here's one. As an atheist, you seem to be more interested in the Bible than most Christians I know. WTF! How many people have heard that one? For a non-believer, you all sure are interested in the Bible. You all sure know a lot about the Bible. You know, more than, you, know, you know more about the scriptures than most Christians I know. Do they have any idea how telling this statement is? You guys know the Bible better than we do. Absolutely we do. If God were to appear before me and command me to kill my own child to show obedience, I would. If God appeared before me and told me to do anything, I would do it. I would not doubt the Almighty, as it's not wise to anger God. Can you imagine? Although we're no one to judge what God will and will not do. You know there's a verse in the Bible that says, don't waste your time on godless chatter, LOL. I'd love to talk more about this sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I read it in front of my computer. I just busted out laughing. <laughs> Here's a post from an atheist. He said, I had about 20 responses, mostly from my Christian friends. A few asked if they could pick the child. <laughs> And another one, if the little bastard doesn't stop running into my bedroom and start jumping on me at 3 a.m., I might consider. <laughs> Obedience. It is monumentally important until it's not. And by the way, I realize that the Abraham-Isaac argument has been used in so many ways, and, and many people are tired of it, but I think it draws a huge circle around where morality comes from. Do you many, and have any of you heard someone say to you, if you don't believe in God, where do you get your morals? You guys heard that one? How can you have morality without God or without the Bible? Well, that's a demonstration. Someone made a moral choice and defied a command of God. Their morality stood in separation from the command of God. Their morality came from within. Though morality was innate. They just demonstrated where morality comes from. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven, the child of God should always obey his commands. Unless, of course, they shouldn't. Excusing this stuff, folks, is a shell game. It's the monument to contradictory thinking. Even the mainstream Christian churches disagree with themselves on the very basic tenets of their faith. The Bible is literal and historically accurate. No, it's a metaphor. The NIV is the best translation. No, the New American Standard is the best translation. Or my favorite, to properly understand the Bible, you have to read it in the original King James. <laughs> God wants you to be prosperous. No, he wants you to be humble and poor. The Holy Spirit enters your heart at the moment of salvation. No, you get saved and have to ask for it separately with a separate prayer. You should be baptized at birth. No, you get baptized after you accept Jesus Christ. You should be anointed with oil. No, you should be immersed in water. 
Once you're saved, you're always saved. No, you can lose your salvation. Heaven is another world. No, this earth will one day become heaven. Hell is damnation eternally in a lake of fire. No, hell is a temporary place where you're separated from God. Or hell is simply the grave. I could go all night. These are the basics. 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Yet can you think of any book ever written that has caused more confusion than the Bible? Eternity is in the balance. It is critical that the least common denominator be able to understand the message and receive it. God wants everyone everywhere to be saved. Yet while our grandparents, who can't even program the DVD player, can send a clearly worded message via email halfway around the world in about 30 seconds, and we know exactly what they mean and what they want, Yahweh decided that a more effective method for communication would be a book written by unverifiable authors, subjectively canonized and translated by fallible humans over thousands and thousands of years. Anyone else wonder why God's letters to humankind had to be canonized? If God wrote the Bible, why did councils have to get together and vote on which ones made the final cut? Isn't that weird? Why does no one else in the church question that? It always bothered me, even as a believer. Why, why do people vote on which ones are holy? If they're all written and divinely inspired, it makes no sense. And if you were a parent and you saw an important letter written to your child, something earth-shattering, life-shaking, written to your child who lived elsewhere, and you knew that somewhere along the way you sent the wire... You sent the telegram and the message got distorted. Wouldn't you, if you knew, do whatever you could to fix it, clear it up, make sure that the right message got in? Absolutely. Your house is on fire, you know? You have to have this message. I will make sure you know so that you can make the right choices. Oh, I see. The Lord works in mysterious ways. His ways are not our ways. We're not supposed to understand. We just have to trust that he knows best. We just have to have faith. And in adhering to their faith, so many families give their allegiance to a, a fantastic, invisible, contradictory, often immoral father figure. And they ostracize their children, their grandchildren, their nephews and nieces. We are two days from the Thanksgiving holiday. Now, even if you don't buy the story of Christopher Columbus, otherwise known as the guy who got lost. <laughs> <laughs> The holiday is supposed to be a time where family and friends get together. We do. We love Thanksgiving. Love the holidays. You enjoy each other and you give thanks. Now, how many people, if you're comfortable raising your hand, how many people in this room are going to spend time with family, religious family? A tremendous number of you. How many of you are already tense about it? A little weird about it. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Because your family hates the fact that you're a non-believer. And even when they don't say anything, they still communicate their dissatisfaction with every single gesture. It's anger, it's pity, it's condescension, it's humiliation. It's the elephant in the room. You're an embarrassment to us. We didn't raise you like this. What happened to you? What happened to you? The rest of us believe in God. Why can't you? You're the only one. Can anybody relate? Anybody? In the name of love, religious parents cut themselves off emotionally from their children. Sometimes they cut themselves off physically. I see the stories every day on my website, my Facebook page from non-believers, sons, daughters, spouses, cousins, grandchildren, friends, co-workers, made to pay a price, a very heavy price, for having a mind of their own. I made some notes from actual user comments and emails that I have received over the last several months. One said, I haven't spoken to my mother in four years. My grandparents stopped sending me cards of any kind, birthdays included. I've been removed from Facebook by my mother, aunts, uncles, cousins, and many so-called friends. 
I was effectively disowned and cut from my father's will. I was informed of an exchange between a religious mother and her atheist child. The mother actually said the words to the child, I would rather you have died as an infant than be an atheist as an adult. It gives me the chills to think about it. I brought part of a letter that I received. I will call her Karen. And this demonstrates many of the challenges that free thinking people face in a religious culture where the burden of proof is on them and yet we are so often made to feel like the, the cast out ones. My name is Karen, I'm 27 years old. My entire family is extremely Southern Baptist and when I came out atheist to them, I figured there would be some tension. But boy, oh boy, did I underestimate them. My aunt no longer speaks to me and she tells my cousins that they aren't allowed to speak to me either. She says that I am the Antichrist. Anybody ever heard that done? I hear it all the time. You're the Antichrist. How could a family member say such a hideous thing? Me, I'm a military wife. I've been for 10 years. I'm a nurse. I'm a good, decent person. But somehow, I'm the Antichrist. My husband and I have been trying to conceive a child for the majority of the time we've been married. Out of our 10 years together, there have been eight years of tests, procedures, shots, and pills. I'm physically unable to conceive anymore. My aunt has informed me more than once that it is my fault. She says that God is punishing me for not believing. In the first year of my marriage, I was pregnant, but I was unable to carry him to full term. And at six and a half months, I delivered my son early. He did not survive. Family members were called and the word spread fast. My aunt called my hospital room just a few short hours after my son took his last breath. Instead of saying how sorry she was, she simply said, maybe next time you get pregnant, you will believe. I think you've learned your lesson. You killed this baby by not accepting the truth. God works in mysterious ways, and I think you got what you deserved. I'm truly thankful for Karen, because she stood her ground in the midst of venomous, unbelievable emotional blackmail from people who should have been her advocates, people who would rather hold their hands up to an invisible being in the sky than hold their hand out and touch, in a positive way, a flesh and blood person who needed them the most. I'm thankful for the people in this room who have taken a stand. I mean, I see the t-shirts and the bumper stickers already. I've seen tattoos. People are wearing freaking atheist tattoos out there. Talk about commitment. <laughs> <laughs> You've decided you're in Oklahoma City and you are an atheist. I understand what you're going through. It is not easy in this part of the country. <coughs> now, I love Oklahoma. I was born here. And I know that Oklahoma takes a lot of heat for being in the middle of what people call flyover country. How many people were born in this state? May I see your hands? A lot of you. I hear a lot of people who really razz Oklahoma. They really razz it a lot. Oh, what a backwater place. They treated me horribly. What a bunch of, you know, and then they leave and go, go elsewhere. That has not been my experience. Granted, we have our challenges. But I, I love being here. I would rather stay here and try to change it from the inside out to impact the culture from the inside out because there's a lot to love about this state. I, I just love it. Yeah, there are some little pockets of Hooterville from time to time. <laughs> you know, you can almost hear it. You're driving down the road and you hit a certain town and you can just almost hear the ding 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 I get that. You know, we live, in a, we live in a community of pickup trucks, gun racks in the back, and God and Jesus, God and country. I love God. I love my country. Amen. We live in that part of the country. I get it. But we also live in a place where you're driving down the street, somebody gives you the right of way, and you give them the little wave. They give you one right back, usually with a smile. We live in a place where if the sports team loses a championship, the city doesn't riot on itself when the game is over. Oklahoma City, as much as anybody knows what it's like to have people come together in a crisis after the, after the uh, federal building went down, in some places, the city would have torn itself to pieces. Oklahoma City came together, right? Believer and non-believer. 
After the 99 tornado, I was on the air that morning. We were predicting severe weather. Who knew? We were in Tulsa predicting severe weather. It's going to start around the city. It's going to come down the turnpike. Well, it, it sure did. It didn't hit us, but you guys got, got your ass kicked. It was terrible. What did this city do? Did it freak out? Was there looting? Was there rioting? Was there craziness? No, the whole freaking city came together. There's a lot to love about where we are. And I would rather stay here and try to fix things from the inside out, to try to impact our culture, to remind the churches on every half block. Do you guys have those here? You're Baptist, and you got your Assembly of God, another Baptist, and Pentecostal, and Baptist, and another Baptist, and then, and then there's a huge sea of like Baptist and Pentecostal church. They don't call them Pentecostal, most of them. They call them non-denominational. And then in the middle, there's like one little Catholic diocese. There's like one little Catholic church. <laughs> I'm thankful that I live in this state. I'm thankful that I live in a country where I can put a website up that is called The Thinking Atheist that essentially challenges the very existence of God. And I am constitutionally protected. Try that in Iran. You will disappear in the middle of the night. I saw your hands off or assassinate you or your, or your relatives. I'm thankful for the families who have managed to live around their disagreements. I know there are many who have successfully managed to live together, even though it's a little tense. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for Natalie, this young lady here at the side of the room, who has uh, been a tremendous amount of support to me. I'm just crazy about her. And the truth is, is that she has paid and the family has paid a tremendous price for the amount of time and effort I've had to put into the thinking atheist endeavors because it's time away from them. It's a one-man show, mostly. I'm so thankful for Hillary and our volunteers who've managed to come out and, 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 and do what they can to try to shore it up. I'm thankful that we are alive in a time when physicians don't treat migraines and epilepsy by drilling holes in your head. Like depression and migraines, they, they, they take an ice pick to your skull less than a century ago. We live in a time when we can see fully realized three-dimensional maps of the brain and the lungs and the nervous system, how the organs work, how the skeletal system works, where they actually administer anesthesia before your surgery. People take that for granted. I'm glad it's here. Can you imagine? A long time ago, it was a mallet to the head or, hey, well, this is going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> We live in a time when the human genome is being mapped. We're transplanting hearts and lungs and even faces. You guys see the lady on, she was on the news this week. She had her face ripped off in that horrible attack of the, it was like a, uh, was it a chimpanzee? Yeah. A, a face transplant. The stuff which just a few years ago was the stuff of science fiction, it's happening today. We live in a time when robots are assisting doctors in the, in the, in the uh, operating room. We're growing human skin in a lab. We're exploring the stem cell and things like nanotechnology, Ooh, microscopic robots that might grow through one day and kill cancer cells. Are you shitting me? That's awesome. <laughs> Look at how far we've come. And we see more amazing stuff on the Discovery Channel regarding our own body and science and the cosmos now than all of the people in science classrooms saw just a few decades ago in their private universities. I'm thankful to live in an area where instead of talking about traveling by foot or horse or a donkey over 30 miles, back-breaking miles, we're talking about sending probes tens of millions of miles to explore and send back images from other worlds. There's no need for fairy tales about a burning bush when we could observe firsthand close-up images of our own burning sun. We can see it with our own eyes. It's amazing to see the solar storms and to be able to know what it's made of. And it's just, a, it boggles the mind. No need for stories of sea monsters. We can plunge down into the ocean's depths, miles down, and observe creatures much more interesting. No need for chariots of fire when we can use rockets to escape our own atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound. It's a relatively new world that you and I live in where we no longer believe we are the center of all things, but we can actually look up into the stars and catch a glimpse of a vast heaven, a visible heaven, a tangible, a real heaven 
that our ancestors never dreamed of. Now, there are some who are going to reject all of this no matter what happens. They hold on to their ancient book, right? They carry it with them everywhere they go. No matter what you say, this is it. This is as far as we go. This is the limitation. These are the boundaries. Excusing, equivocating, finding wild, ever-changing scenarios where the supernatural claim is the winner and everything else comes up empty. For you and I, no more games. We've decided. Show me the numbers. Show me the evidence. No more fairy tales. If I may quote the late cosmologist Carl Sagan, he said, for me, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Now, I was 14 when PBS aired uh, the TV special Cosmos. Anybody remember the original airing of Cosmos 31 years ago? <laughs> Bunch of young whippersnappers. I watched a lot of it, but I watched it under supervision through my God glasses, right? Anytime evolution came up, we just need your God, that's wrong. That's wrong. So we weren't really listening. I was a minnow in the ocean. I really had no idea what I was seeing. I was 38 years old before I truly began to appreciate Carl Sagan, his life and legacy. And unlike so many scientists who are brilliant with the facts, but lousy at telling the stories of science, Carl Sagan was something different. He was a poet. He was passionate. He painted pictures with words. Now his face lit up when he talked about the universe we live in. He was born this month, November 1934 and he died much too soon. Now, before we go to our q and I, I, I finished a new video, which is a tribute to the man. It is a retelling of one of Carl Sagan's classic poems. It has not released to the public yet. Would you like to see it? Yeah. This is the work of Carl Sagan. It is not his voice, but these are his words. Enjoy. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that, in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think about the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel, 
on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot the only home we've ever known. <laughs>